Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doran Barnes, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of Foothill Transit. And we are excited to share our story in advancing zero emission vehicle technology with you today. I'm joined by a great lineup of my colleagues here who will each tell parts of our story and uh, share with you the journey that we have been through. It's uh, certainly been exciting, uh, but not without its challenges. And we'll talk about that uh, during our time together here. Uh, moving on to our next slide. To give you just a, a little bit of background about Foothill Transit, uh, we are the primary fixed route public transit provider for the Pomona and San Gabriel Valleys of Los Angeles County, so Eastern Los Angeles County, uh, serving the suburban communities, but also linking uh, those communities to downtown Los Angeles. Uh, it's about a 327 square mile service area, so reasonably large in size, and about a 1.5 million service area population. Now, the numbers here that we have in terms of boardings are our pre-COVID numbers. Um, prior to uh, the arrival of COVID, we were carrying about almost 13 million boardings per year, uh, 43,000 boardings per day. Our numbers are about half that now, but uh, we're looking forward to the return of our riders once we get into a post-COVID environment. Uh, we operate a combination of routes, uh, local routes serving the suburban communities, but also express routes linking into downtown Los Angeles. We've always been committed to clean fuel and sustainability and focusing on the environment. And of our current fleet, we have 343 buses that operate on compressed natural gas, 32 buses that operate in our zero emission electric fleet. And that's really going to be our focus today. We're very much a mission driven organization and innovation is at our absolute core. And if we could move to the next slide, uh, you can see our full mission, which is to be the premier public transit provider uh, focusing on these uh, various aspects, safety, courtesy, quality, responsiveness, efficiency, and ultimately innovation. Each of these elements are incredibly important to what we do. Sometimes they push and pull against each other, but ultimately our goal is to do all of these things as we serve our, our communities. Moving on to our next slide. You might ask why, why advance a zero emission bus program? Well, if you if you're anywhere near the Los Angeles County Basin and particularly Eastern Los Angeles, uh, air quality has been a challenge for, for many, many years and we live with it day in and day out. We do have a large population base that we serve, which gives us the flexibility to implement a program like this. And a real key for us was that funding was available. We initially launched our program using funding that was provided by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And funding is, again, something that we'll touch on at various points here because it's great to have these goals, but there have to be the resources to be able to put this all together. In addition, a key driver has been the regulations that have been put forward by the California Air Resources Board. Again, important steps in moving us towards a zero emission uh, transit technology. Um, but ultimately, again, it's about matching up that goal of, of zero emission and clean air and resources to make it all happen gave us the jump start to be able to get started in, in this, on this journey. Moving to the next slide, certainly a key date in our history, September 3rd, 2010, over a decade ago. That's when we launched our first heavy duty fast charge electric buses on a line that operates between the cities of Pomona and Laverne. We were the first in North America to launch this technology. And while there was an awful lot of work that led up to the September 3rd date, it's, it's one that we, we definitely reflect upon as being a key milestone in our journey. In the 10 years since, we've learned a lot, we've experimented, we continue to learn. And our purpose today here is to share that story. At this time, moving to our next slide, it's my honor to introduce Roland Cordero, our Director of Maintenance and Vehicle Technology. Roland has been our point person in advancing our program and uh, will take you to the next piece of the story. Roland. Thank you, Doran. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, next slide, please. As uh, Doran mentioned, our deployment of battery electric buses began in 2010 on line 291, serving the cities of Pomona and Laverne. Um, in order for the buses to meet the service requirements, we installed a high power fast charge station and two overhead charges at the Pomona Transit Center. Uh, it's located at the middle of line 291. <clears throat> One charger serves the northbound buses while the second charger serves the southbound buses. Over the last 10 years, we've charged our buses at the Transit Center over 200,000 times and logged 2.4 million miles on, uh, on our transit buses from operating on line 291. Uh, again, the Pomona Transit Center is centrally located on the route 
and offers an off-street charging station with a charging height clearance of 11 feet, nine inches. Uh, the location provides a safe and secure manner of charging buses overhead. We operate 15 short range fast charge and in route for Terabus from our Pona operations facility. Next slide, please. Um, in 2017, we completed construction of two charging stations at the Azusa Intermodal Transit Center adjacent to LA Metro's Gold Line station. They support 14 Proterra extended range buses operating on line 280. And this is our second fully electrified line serving the cities of Azusa, Pony Hills and cities in between. Now the chargers are used to trickle charge the buses to extend the range beyond 150 miles that we get on a single charge. Uh, some of the blocks in line 280 are over, the 100, over 150 miles long. Uh, the 14 buses are per extended range uh, deployed from our Arcadia Irondale facility. And we've logged over 1 million miles over the last three years of operating on line 280. Next slide, please. Um, on December, 2019, we completed construction and installation of 12 60 kilowatt and one 125 kilowatt charges at our Arcadia Irondale facility to charge our fleet of 17 extended range buses operated out of that yard. The 125 kilowatt charger will be used to charge our two double deck buses. And this is our first high capacity in depot charging station. Next slide, please. Um, for safety and efficient use of space, the 13 chargers were located on two bus parking spaces rather than on every bu uh, bus parking space. We installed an overhead canopy to mount the dispensers and incorporated a motorized hose reel. The charger plug is mechanically retracted down by a push button to charge the bus. By pushing the same button, the, pl the plug is retracted back up and secured. Uh, next slide, please. Our next presenter is Joseph Raquel, Fuddle Transit's uh, Director of Planning, who will talk about developing raw planning for an electrified line. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Um, next slide, please. As Roland mentioned, here at Foothill Transit, we have two different bus and charging technologies. And our charging strategy really depends on what resources, what resources or in this case, chargers are available. So here on the screen, you have we have um, a picture of the first line that we um, that we electrified. That's line 291. Two line 291 uses fast charge buses, fast charge short range buses, and they have access to two overhead chargers, which are located mid route. And as Roland mentioned, each charger is specific to the direction the bus is charging. And um, no. Yep. Please. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, so as you can see here, we actually build five minutes of charge time into the schedule. So the box here, you see um, PTC, PTC. You notice the five minute um, difference in time. That's where we build in the, the charge. So as each, so as the bus is charging, the customers have the opportunity to either board or exit the bus, but if they are continuing along the journey and not stopping at the Pomona Transit Center, they wait until the bus continue, finishes charging before continuing. In the event one of the chargers are down or out of service, then the bus skips the charge in that direction, but must charge in the opposite direction. And in doing so, the state of charge is a lot lower than it would be if it had charged both ways. So the actual charge time increases from five to about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the bus's current state of charge. And with um, a bus headway that's every 15 minutes, you can imagine what it does to the schedule downstream. Um, next slide, please. The next um, line that we fully electrified was line 280. Line 280 ha um, uses the long range bus, um, electric buses and also has access to two charging stations at the Northern Terminus. For buses assigned to this route, we use opportunity charge. And as you can see in the, um, in the blocking schedule or vehicle schedule down at the bottom, we schedule a 12 minute opportunity charge every three to four trips. 
And by doing this, this gives us an additional 100 miles of range, which allows the buses to complete their, um, their, um, their cycle or their revenue trips without, so we wouldn't be able to accomplish running these longer blocks. Next slide, please. The, um, the next two routes that we fully electrified are lines 860 and 861 in the city of Duarte. Um, these, but, um, this particular route uses the, um, the long range buses, but does not have access to any overhead charges out in the field. And a little background on this route. Um, when we acquired these routes from the city of Duarte, they requested that we use all electric buses for these particular routes. And um, when we did our testing, we found out that two electric buses were not enough to complete all the necessary trips, even though the, the amount of miles was in the, the service range of the buses. Now, why is that? On the northern parts of this route, of these routes, um, it's pretty hilly, so topology really plays a role. And um, because of the, the hills, it depletes the battery faster, hence you have shorter range. And how did we um, alleviate this or how did we remedy this? As you can see down at the, the block vehicle schedule down at the bottom, you'll notice the second and third lines. Um, you see that two hour gap, that's where we do a two hour opportunity charge. So what happens is the one bus does uh, five trips in the morning, then goes back to the yard, charges for two hours, then comes back out to the field to complete the remaining service trips. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons learned, definitely lesson number one, test, 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 to see what the actual range of your bus will be because Foothill Transit's range will not be the same as say ABTA or Long Beach. And if you're going to do in-route charging, the ideal location will be at the, terminus, at the terminuses or endpoints and not in the middle. And definitely route variation and route characteristic really affects the range. And definitely test the vehicles on the different, type, different types of services you run. In our case, we tested it on both express and local and then you see the results there. And definitely charge the buses every opportunity you get to help extend the range. Opportun opportunity charging a bus throughout the day gave us an additional 100 miles, which enabled us to, to run a line 280. Um, next slide, please. Now I'd like to introduce um, our Director of Marketing and Communication, Elisa Frizema, who will now talk about our marketing strategy. Thanks, Joe, and thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to dig too deep into the weeds and give you a broad view of how we tackled the challenges that popped up while talking about zero emission bus tech to the public, but I am available to answer any questions that you have via email at ffriesema at foothilltransit.org. Also, you may have noticed, because I'm a marketing director, that a few of us have some Foothill Transit-specific Zoom backgrounds. We've made those and quite a few others available to the public for download at foothilltransit.org slash share. Next slide, please. Now, there are as many ways to talk about zero emission bus technology as there are buses in our fleet, which is about 370. And in order to be effective, it was crucial to narrow it down to just two key goals in our communications. And of course, we drew directly from our mission statement, which Doran outlined earlier. We focused on enhancing awareness of safety and innovation. Audience always defines the message and it became immediately apparent that our two key audiences, the general public and our direct stakeholders, had somewhat different priorities and needed different narratives. As with any new technology or scientific advancement, the public first and foremost wants to know that it's safe. And once you've provided ample reassurance through science and demonstration, they now have the room to be amazed. And once amazed, the customers ultimately just wanna get where they need to go safely and without fuss. The bonus is that the ride is now much quieter than before and it makes for a much more comfortable commute. Now our stakeholders, they want efficiency and a better experience for their constituents and they want sustainability and not just the environmental kind. Is the technology fundable? And then ultimately, who will pay for it? Next slide, please. 
Now, the tools of our communications are pretty standard. There are the digitals and the press outreach. I'm highlighting here some of the materials that we created specifically for grant applications and lobbying information. These fact summaries help sculpt a positive and professional narrative that takes zero emissions bus technology out of a pie in the sky territory and into the yes we can narrative. And it has worked. The purchase of our latest zero emission bus fleet vehicles was funded in part by a Metro Express, Express Lanes grant. And I should stress here that collaboration is also absolutely key with your internal teams. The communications team is in constant contact with planning, with finance, with our vehicle tech teams, all to make sure that our stories are accurate, current, and compelling for our targeted audiences. Next slide, please. A zero emission bus branding is different, but actually the same. Our service should be seamless to the customer. And again, we touch on safety and innovation in all of our public communications. As you can see on the top picture, this is our standard livery and on the bottom is our zero emission bus livery. There's just enough difference to show that one of these things is not like the other, but they both definitely belong to Foothill Transit. And again, the bottom line is the customer mostly just wants to know that it works. We want them to know that not much has changed, but what has changed will make their commute and their communities better. Next slide, please. The result is that Foothill Transit is world renowned for being a leader in zero emission bus technology that's eager to share best practices to advance sustainable transportation technologies at home and abroad. Our successful deployment of this technology has also positioned us to more successfully obtain funding and to keep this project evolving and growing. The success has also led to one of our member cities, which Joseph just mentioned, uh, the city of Duarte, asked that we run their city system entirely with a zero emission bus fleet. The success will again be amplified with the upcoming introduction of our nation's first ever electric double deck bus, which is coming to an LA County road near you, slightly teased in the picture here. Next slide. I'd like to now introduce our Director of Finance, Michelle Caldwell. Thank you, Felicia. How in the heck does finance follow marketing and communications, huh? <laughs> okay, um, next slide, please. So as you've heard, uh, we were one of the leaders in the zero emission bus technology. And while that's great, it doesn't give you a lot of um, best practices to follow. So one of the things that we did was in 2018, we uh, engaged a consulting team to assist us to consider all the issues and the elements of this new technology. Um, we hired this team of consultants to do a complete study for us. And in 2019, the team, Burns and McDonald, provided us with a comprehensive study. So you can see this on this chart is our, our detailed fleet acquisition plan. And we provided that to the consultants so that they could uh, calculate both the annual bus replacement costs and the total number of e-buses at each yard or um, they call them depot, we call them yards. And this chart shows that from 2017 through 2033, we would be adding 353 new buses as our existing CNG fleet reached the end of its useful life. At approximately $1 million per bus, this chart tells a story that the total cost for the new buses would be approximately $350 million. But as we worked through this study, we found that actually uh, we would need to purchase 530 new buses because of the range issues that you heard Joe speak about earlier in our presentation. Therefore, the study pretty much told us that we would need to purchase 1.5, one and a half new battery electric buses for every CNG replacement bus. Next slide, please. So one of the things that the study recommended was that uh, we, we were not buying the buses all at once. We were buying the buses over a 30 year period. And so they also recommended that we electrify our yards over, over time. This allowed for the service to be gradually transitioned. Um, so we, we would start with one yard, we would do enough 
electricity to charge, say, the first 14 buses, and then we would go to the next yard. As we, as we purchased the new buses, we would then electrify the yards. The study did tell us that the total cost of electrifying both yards was estimated in 2019 dollars to be $120 million. Next slide, please. Uh, the consultants also provided us with recommendations for operations. Um, from a financial perspective, they recommended that we only charge the buses during off-peak electricity usage, which would lower our overall costs. As I listened to Joe's presentation today about the opportunity charging and the charging en route and the charging in the middle of the day, and uh, as we also um, noted when our consultants also made the recommendation for charging in the middle of the night. Uh, that means all the buses are in the yard all at the same time and the mechanics and the service attendants are moving the buses around so that some can be charged and some can go off in the parking lot. A lot of activity in the middle of the night to get all those buses charged. So that seemed um, a bit challenging. Other yard activities, uh, you know, the typical maintenance and the uh, fair collection, they felt all that could continue like it is today. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide compares the cost of purchasing and operating the CNG buses with the battery electric bus fleet. Using those off-peak charging assumptions, this chart showed that the BEB, the battery electric buses, will cost approximately $500 million over 25 years more than the CNG buses. So although we are excited about transitioning to an even cleaner fuel than CNG, we are constantly on the prowl for funding solutions. How will we uh, buy all of these new buses and electrify our yards and uh, with the current operating funding that we have today? Always a challenge for the finance people. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as part of this, one of the, as part of the kind of, I don't wanna say concern about finances, but as part of the um, search for cost savings and more, more revenue, we asked our consultants to also do a comparison of battery electric bus versus fuel cell electric, also zero emission. And over the time it took us to do this study, we began to get results from our other transit partners who were using fuel cell technology. And so this seemed like something we should add to this study. And of course, Burns and McDonald agreed to do it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> One of the things that you get when you go to the zero emission um, world is there are some credits and some incentives available for transit agencies to pursue to uh, help with some of these um, costs, which seem uh, which are a great deal more than just running the CNG fleet. Um, so the study also considered the rebates and the incentives for the transition uh, to either BEB or fuel cell. And you can see that for the BEB, for the battery electric buses, we have the LCFS credit revenue, which is not available for the fuel cell. The HVIP rebate is, is more for the fuel cell buses, primarily because the fuel cell buses cost more than the battery electric buses. And then of course, there's no electricity rebates because the, um, there's no electricity for the fuel cell, you actually get fuel. All right, next slide, please. The result of the comparison is that the fuel cell bus is slightly more expensive on an annualized basis. You can see 48 million versus 42 million versus 36 million for the CNG, primarily due to the cost of fuel. See the green, or I guess it's green, kind of pea green. Um, bar that, that's the cost of fuel compared to the electricity fees, assuming that the buses are only charged during the optimal off-peak charging times. And also this assumes that the fuel cell cost is not discounted 
we used the current cost of uh, fuel that our um, our partners, uh, AC Transit and Sunline Transit, uh, were use are using for their or OCTA are using for their um, fuel cell. So that was the result of the study and the financial result. And now I'd like to turn. Oh, next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kevin McDonald, who will discuss our current path forward. Kevin. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kevin Parks McDonald, and I serve as deputy CEO for the organization. I saw a question pop up earlier about um, uh, whether we had considered fuel cell, and thank you for that question. Uh, next slide, please. Since we began our zero emissions journey back in 2010, our zero emissions fleet has been made up entirely of battery electric buses or BEBs. And as you've heard from my colleagues, we've experienced some range and operational challenges with deploying BEBs on a subset of our lines. Uh, as we've looked to our neighbors at Sunline and OCTA and others, their fuel cell deployments show promise to address these issues. Additionally, putting all our eggs in the B. BEB basket could severely impact our ability to deliver service in the event of a loss of grid power at one or both of our operating facilities. Michelle just highlighted some of the uh, findings of the Burns McDonald study, including the cost and the complexity of infrastructure construction uh, and the operational challenges as some of the major challenges to operating a fully battery electric fleet uh, for a fleet of our size, uh, 375 buses. At the operating facility, the mechanics uh, or the logistics, I suppose, of the hydrogen fuel process will be very similar to the process of uh, fueling a CNG bus, with each bus taking uh, about 15 to 20 minutes in the fueling lane. Next slide, please. So how exactly does it work? Uh, this video shows that it's produced by New Flyer Industries gives a good high level overview. What if we could use the most abundant element in the universe as a fuel source? And what if, instead of emitting greenhouse gases, transit buses produce clean water vapor? This isn't a far off promise or a research project in progress. It's hydrogen fuel cell technology. In 1993, New Flyer and its technology partners unveiled the world's first hydrogen fuel cell electric bus and we've been pioneering the technology ever since. It's safe, reliable, and it's making public transportation cleaner. Right now, hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, like our Excelsior Charge H2, are in motion across North America, and they're complementing existing fleets of battery electric buses. But why invest in hydrogen? What makes a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus different from a battery electric bus? To answer that, let's take a closer look at how it all fits together. A hydrogen fuel cell takes compressed hydrogen from the fuel tank and combines it with oxygen from the air. This process produces electricity, heat, and H2O, which leaves the tailpipe in the form of clean water vapor. The fuel cell functions as an onboard charger, providing power to charge the batteries while the bus is in motion. This eliminates the need to recharge the batteries at the depot or garage and it extends the range of the bus up to 350 miles before needing to refuel. And refueling hydrogen is a breeze. It takes as little as 12 minutes to refill a 60-foot fuel cell bus, and only half that time for a 40-foot bus. Hydrogen is also incredibly clean and can help you further reduce your carbon footprint. Just one bus can save hundreds of tons of greenhouse gases every year. That's like taking up to 29 cars off the road or planting up to 5,600 trees. It's time to take advantage of this zero emission solution. Dis Thank you. Uh, so for our upcoming fuel cell deployment, we've engaged the services of a consultant, uh, the Center for Transportation and the Environment, and they're currently working with us to develop the bus and the infrastructure specifications to begin both procurements in the upcoming months. Our timeline has fueling infrastructure construction completed in April of next year, 2022. Uh, bus procurement will begin this May with a planned vehicle delivery uh, schedule uh, slated for July, 2022 as well. 
And once the infrastructure and buses are in place, we'll begin in-service testing and performance and cost evaluation before making decisions on future bus procurements. Uh, next slide, please. Our goal is to deploy 20 fuel cell electric buses on line 486 between El Monte and Pomona. Uh, we've received a, a transit and inner city rail capital pro, uh, program or TIRCP grant specifically to place ZEBs or zero emissions buses on that line that serves disadvantaged uh, communities, a rail station and two large college populations. Again, our ultimate goal is service resiliency through fleet and energy diversity. We'll collect and analyze performance and cost data for a real life comparison of uh, fuel cell uh, buses versus battery electric buses as it relates to our particular service profile. And depending on the outcome, we may look to deploy fuel cell uh, buses elsewhere in our service where it would be beneficial. Next slide, please. At this point, I'll hand it back to Roland to uh, talk about an exciting uh, project that's uh, right around the corner. Roland. Next slide, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm really excited about our double deck electric bus. Project uh, started in October of 2016 when we demonstrated the diesel version of Alexander Dennis's double deck bus in our Silver Street route. We ran this for about a week, uh, operating the bus from Montclair Transit Center to downtown LA, and we were able to clear all freeway overpasses, utility lines, as well as street branches. Customers' reactions were overwhelmingly positive. Um, this is our first two double deck battery electric bus built by Alexander Dennis, and they arrived uh, on the 20th of this month. And this is another first for foot of transit as no other a uh, transit agency operates double deck battery electric buses in the US. Uh, these high capacity buses uh, facilitate the transport of more passengers with a single bus while also reducing our impact to the environment. And by the way, uh, they also offer a smoother ride than our fleet of 60 foot articulated buses. Uh, buses are equipped with a 648 kilowatt hour battery energy with expected efficiency of three kilowatts per mile or 200 miles of range on a single charge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide contains a video on our design review and testing of a prototype double deck battery electric bus. We're absolutely delighted to have Foothill with us here today in Millbrook. Uh, they've come over to the UK to check on the, on the progress of the project. This is really an amazing experience for us to come here to Millbrook. Uh, to see how the bus performs. Uh, we are really impressed. The quality, the ride quality, the performance is just outstanding. ADI has been an amazing partner since the beginning. They, they've listened to what we're looking for in a vehicle. They've taught us a lot about what their vehicle can do. We've been working with them, talking to them for about two or three years now. We've been looking at this on, on paper for a long time, and to see it finally here in the flesh is uh, it's amazing. It's a beautiful vehicle. particular example here is our engineering test vehicle. So this gives us the opportunity to fully prove out all of the batteries, all of the thermal systems, everything around the unique systems that make an EV. What I love about the 500 is the design, first off. I mean, it's really eye-catching design, and I think with our livery uh, you know, applied to it, it's, it's really gonna catch the attention of folks in the Los Angeles area. So we have a commitment to go all electric by 2030. We thought this vehicle would be would be ideal to take a lot of people, small footprint on uh, the Los Angeles freeways. Los Angeles is known to have one of the worst air qualities in the US. So our goal is to help clean the air. So the benefits are clearly a low emission vehicle, zero emissions. 
it deals with congestion. You can take 85 passengers fully seated on the bus, takes away 85 cars on the road. They have one particular route, which is a Silver Street route, which is a high capacity commuter route. And they're very, very keen to put double deck vehicles on that because of the capacity requirement. Not just moving people from point A to point B, but it's more of having a sustainable and clean fleet to provide that service. We're going to be doing quite a bit of, you know, uh, field testing while we have them there and get, get some customer feedback on the vehicles. I think I know what the feedback is going to be. I'm pretty sure it's going to be very positive. Well, I wish I could take this one home right now. It was actually really smooth and uh, my throttle response is incredible. I rarely had to use my brakes. As far as handling turns, it's amazing. It's like driving a little sports car. Uh, the steering is also smooth. It's quieter, less vibrations. I want to see how fast I could go, how fast it would maneuver on a turn, how fast I could take it on a turn. And I could actually do a figure eight, no problem. The vehicle is comfortable, the ride quality is fantastic. The higher capacity would provide us to move more people uh, more efficiently with clean energy, with clean technology. So we're looking forward to getting these vehicles, all electric, quiet, smooth ride, uh, in, you know, from the San Gabriel Valley into downtown Los Angeles. So it's a great opportunity for us to develop a strong business relationship with Foothill. The Alexander Double Deck Bus would play a vital role in California as we move forward. Great. I think that was a just really great video. So, um, and of course, really great presentations from all of our speakers. I think it's really inspirational, the work that Foothill Transit is doing to advance zero emission vehicle technology uh, to, to move people around uh, the Foothill communities there. So thank you for your presentations. Uh, now we're going to open up to questions and Q&A session from the audience. Uh, we had a couple that came up and I think they were answered during the presentation, but let me go back. Uh, we had one asked earlier, which was how frequently have the overhead chargers gone down and what kind of maintenance do they need? That's just for uh, maybe Joe or, or anybody at Foothill who transit. Uh, I'll, who take that one. I'll take that. So, one. Thanks, Roland. Yeah, what's really interesting is our, our overhead chargers have worked so perfectly over the last 10 years that we've been using them. Um, one funny thing that that we experienced over the years is whenever a, a charger would uh, be out of service, what we found out is there's a emergency button, an e-stop button on the charger uh, unit itself. And that's for emergency purposes when you need to shut off the power into the charging station. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the electrical requirements does not require a locked cover for that e-stop button. And we've had few people that would normally, that would press that button on a regular basis, not a regular basis, quite often. So that was our early issues in the beginning. So what our approach was, we put a sign above the e-stop button that the charging station was, was uh, being surveilled with the surveillance cameras and that cut that down drastically. Uh, so that was the only issue that we've had. In terms of maintenance, uh, we contract with Proterra for the maintenance of the uh, chargers uh, since it's their proprietary technology. Um, there's a monthly uh, inspection, just looking at all the wiring connections, the brushes, and so on. Um, um, there's a uh, uh, every six month inspection, which covers more than what they normally do. Uh, looking at programming, look at the energy, uh, checking out the the, the charger uh, capacity itself, and then there's an annual, which is a, a larger uh, maintenance work where they have to take the charger and bring it down kind of look at it, look at all the, the wirings and the communication system. So that's, that's more of a, of a um, I'd say, a more involved uh, inspection of the uh, charges themselves. But overall, we've been happy with, with how the system works and uh, we've been able to charge our buses on the Pomona Transit Center for the last 10 years. It's really great to hear that it's been a relatively smooth experience. 
we had another question. How does the well to wheel energy calculation look for fuel cell vehicles? And uh, I'll leave that open to the Foothill Transit Group, but also I pulled up a couple resources from the Department of Energy uh, that I'll post here into the chat. Hopefully those will help. Uh, just maybe I can start with this one. And um, I guess the short answer is, I don't know. So whatever you have in the chat that you're posting is, uh, uh, is certainly very valuable. I think in part, there's a really interesting discussion, I think, about, um, uh, about well-to-wheel or complete energy capture for these various technologies. And that's certainly a part of, of the mix here. In part, that discussion is happening at a level that's beyond us. So we're working to, um, to achieve the mandates that have been put forward by the California Air Resources Board to go zero emission with the technologies that are available to us. And we're looking at both technologies closely and we're looking at it from a variety of standpoints. Uh, as you heard in Michelle's presentation, um, we're looking at total cost of operation and really trying to figure out how do we get to that best overall cost of operation and cost of capital to deliver the service that we're trying to deliver and comply with the, the goals that have been set forward by the state of California. Um, so it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a complex um, uh, question. Uh, there is lots of research out there, um, but we're really looking to figure out how do we perfect these two technologies to, to accomplish our mission. I don't know if my colleagues have more details on that. And I know Joseph, you've got some, uh, uh, some, some great links here for us. And nothing to add to that, Jordan. I think the, the, the point is, you know, it, it, it's similar on the on the electric side, where you know we look at where the where the grid power comes from. Uh, there's probably, you know, there there's some challenges there as well. And and we know on the hydrogen side, there are going to be those uh, uh, those clean issues that we need to we need to look into as well. But yeah, we'll be we'll be tracking that down. Great, thank you both. Moving on to another question. Are you using a smart charging management software? If so, what kind? If not, is there a timeline to start implementing it? That's a rolling question. Yeah, so we have a telematic system installed in our fleet of battery electric buses using Vericity, uh, V-I-R-C-I-T-I. Um, this is how we, we, we uh, monitor the performance of the electric bus, monitor performance of the drivers, range, uh, how our buses are performing. Um, so that, that's the system that we're using right now. Um, we opted to use Vericity because it's a third party uh, system uh, in case that, you know, if we ever move forward with buying electric buses with a different OEM, we can still use the same system. We're not tied down to one specific, uh, or we wouldn't have to uh, operate a system that's what, you know, two different systems that comply with each type of different bus. Great, thank you, Roland. Our next question is, how did Foothill Transit handle maintenance facility upgrades needed to charge zero emission buses, or battery electric buses? Did the improvements get phased in or wasn't, or were all improvements required uh, all at once? And did the modification to the existing facilities require major upgrades on the utility side of the meter? So for our uh, overhead charging station, uh, we uh, partnered with Southern California Edison. Uh, what we actually partnered with Southern California Edison when we started this project 10 years ago, uh, not just in our facility charging stations, but also at our, our transit center, Pomona Transit Center and uh, at the Azusa Transit Intermodal Center. For our in-depot chargers, uh, we applied, we were one of the four transit agencies uh, that was part of the pilot program for the uh, Transport Charge Ready program. And uh, Southern California did a lot of the work in terms of the infrastructure, uh, utility requirements from uh, the transform all the way up to our, our bus parking lot. Uh, Proterra, who provide, provided us with the chargers, um, basically built, I mean, they had, they had their system and all they had to do was to connect to, to the grid. So a lot of that work in terms of uh, specifications for utilities, wiring, electrical connections was all done by Southern California Edison. It was a great partnership for us. And uh, I think they're moving forward with a second uh, group of uh, transport charge ready program that uh, I would you know, recommend for everybody to apply for that because that was a lot of a lot of uh, headache that was taken away from us 
uh, with, with the utilities doing all that work, including permitting, uh, setting up the plans and whatnot. And Joseph, to, to add to that, um, in a, a shout out to our, our colleagues at Southern California Edison, um, they have been really, really important partners and um, really engaged with us in terms of, of working through this journey. We're very grateful for their help. Um, I think one of the one of the key takeaways from uh, from our journey has been um, when you're looking at grid powered equipment, working with the the utility from which you will you will draw that power is absolutely critical to success. Um, the vehicles are different; they're way different than CNG buses, different than um, diesel powered buses. But it's not the bus piece of it that we found to be the most the most complex. It's the you know how are you going to charge these things. Um, so again, uh, our thanks to the folks at Edison and for anyone who's looking at these technologies, whoever your underlying utility is, engage them early and um, uh, gain their partnership because it's, it's crucial to, to the success of a program. It's really great to hear that you've had great partnerships with SoCal Edison and uh, yeah, they definitely have an ambitious plan with their next Charge Ready 2 program. So hopefully yeah. we'll see a lot more of these partnerships and a lot more rollout of uh, electric uh, zero emission vehicles uh, across our region. Next question we have is what hydrogen refueling infrastructure are you preferencing? Electrolyzer or delivered? So we just started working with CTE in our fuel cell program. Uh, we're not looking at an electro sorry, electrolyzer. Uh, over the last three meetings that we've had, there's been talk about uh, trucking liquid hydrogen, but we're not at that point yet. We're still you know, in the beginning portions of our project. As we move forward, we'll finalize that and, and see what path that we're gonna take. But it's either gonna be trucked in liquid or, or uh, uh, different forms of uh, hydrogen, but we're not gonna build an electrolyzer. We'd love to build an electrolyzer. I think the challenge we run into is it's, it's about real estate. Um, and again, as we've looked at this program, both from a grid powered standpoint and a hydrogen fuel cell standpoint, um, we're operating in, you know, in Los Angeles County where real estate is expensive and scarce. Uh, we're running at full capacity in terms of the number of buses that we can house at our operating facilities. And so as we add fueling infrastructure for either one of these technologies, um, again, that, that's been a, a real challenge. We'd love to be able to do, uh, you know, to have an electrolyzer on site. Uh, it's just, it's a real estate problem. That's a great point, Doran. And that's something that we heard at our previous webinars uh, the last two weeks as well, is that uh, you need quite a large pad to be able to uh, have an electrolyzer on site. And that's really one of our, our friends and colleagues at Sunline Transit, who again, we collaborate with on a, on a constant basis. Um, you know, they do have the good fortune of having a little more real estate to work with. And we're excited about what they're doing. We wish we could do what they're doing. We just don't have the room. Absolutely. A uh, few more questions we have here. And, and just as a reminder, everybody, uh, you can enter your questions into the chat or else you can also use the raise hand feature uh, if you'd like to be unmuted and, and ask your questions. Uh, I like this next question. Will the new double deck bus fit under your current charging canopy? Very practical question. Let's hope so. Ah, oh, thank you very much. That was a good question. I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, well, the overhead is not an overhead charge bus. It's a plug-in bus. But on our canopy, the canopy was designed to be able to afford the charging, uh, the double deck bus to pull up underneath the canopy. The, the overhead structure is 16 feet tall and our uh, double deck battery electric bus is 13 feet, six inches tall. So we got a lot of room headway. Um, and we took that into consideration when, when the uh, uh, in-depot charging infrastructure was being designed. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to see a topless uh, battery electric bus after we've been delivered from the UK. <laughs> so I don't know if it's relevant, Roland, for you to mention, but we did have to raise the bus washer. Is that? Uh, no, we didn't raise the bus wash. Uh, so we have a, an existing bus wash for a fleet of uh, single floor buses. So what we did was on the other, uh, the bay next to our, our current electric, I mean, the uh, current bus wash, uh, we built a, uh, a double deck specific uh, bus wash to accommodate that, that tall bus. So we wouldn't have to go out there with squeegees and trying to wipe the tall <laughs> bus on it. I, I was threatening to make Roland go out with yeah. one of those long pole brushes and a bucket and, you know, <laughs> that would be, it was weekend activity, but yeah. I, I think as fondly of that. 
I asked our, our director of facilities, uh, Charlene Bailey, to get it going because I don't want to be out there on a platform scrubbing the side of that double neck bus. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Next question up is, do you anticipate any challenges with messaging to the community about the safety of fuel cell electric buses? Oh, goody, one for me. <laughs> um, there's always, the, the fun part about this is that there's some parallels with our current um, electric bus program that we can borrow from to talk about the science. But the other side of this is that because fuel cell technology is new to the public, it's a great chance to tell stories. And I love telling stories. That's why I'm in this position. But um, it, we're always looking to our partners who have already sort of uh, gone ahead of us. So I think right now there are um, three agencies in the state of California that are running fuel cell buses. That's AC Transit up in the Bay Area. We've got Sunline here in the Palm Springs area and then OCTA. And of course, like Doran said, we collaborate heavily uh, with Sunline and we'll be looking to them to see what were the things that they tripped up on first. Um, chances are, it, like with the electric bus technology, the big thing you wanna hit on is safety. People wanna know that it's a safe ride. And then once they figure out what this is all about, honestly, they just wanna get to where they need to go and they wanna do it without a lot of fuss. Um, so we'll be able to tell that, that big story at the beginning and then hopefully this will just be another part of our fleet that everybody enjoys. Great answer, thank you. And uh, this is, I think, more of a comment than a question, but I think it's a good one and, and shows that we have a lot of experts, I think, uh, and folks in the industry in the room. Uh, and I think this was uh, in response to the weld wheels question, is, which was, uh, weld wheel efficiency can be viewed as, can we get enough re renewable energy? Of course, that's important. Like, where, where is the energy coming from? Uh, this includes not only transmission and conversion losses, but the ability to capture remote or cur curtailed energy, or excuse me, renewables and to distribute the energy in dense urban areas and high utilization fleets. Both aspects must be considered and grid and hydrogen approaches have different advantages. And I think Joseph, as we, as we look to the two technologies and as it really becomes more than just the bus, it really becomes the, the well to the wheel, if you will. The, where does the energy come from and how does that ultimately get to delivering the service? Um, you know, and one might say, you know, we've talked, to, uh, and our journey really focuses on both grid power and fuel cell. And so, you know, a question that might come up is, okay, Foothill Transit, which way are you going? Are you going grid or are you going fuel cell? And I think the answer is yes, we think. We're not quite sure, but we think. Um, and that's really, a, a, I think, a key, a key point in where we are in this journey, where we're looking at both of these technologies. We think both of these technologies have a place in our transit delivery program, there's more work to be done to perfect the technologies and really optimize their use for different types of applications. The other part that we've got to continue to be focused on is, again, that, that beginning to end cycle. So it's not just about the bus, but it's where and how is the power being generated? Um, is it coming from a renewable source or not? As we know, the California power grid, the aspiration and the goal is to be completely green. We're not there yet. So we've got to keep pushing on all of these different fronts to really get to that, that true ultimate goal of being zero emission you know, from beginning to end and having the ultimate environmental benefit. It's, it's a complex challenge. It's, um, you know, it's one we've got to continue to lean in on all aspects of. Really great points there. Uh, and yeah, that's certainly a question we see a lot. Hydrogen or battery, which, which is it gonna be in you know, all of the above right now? Yep. Um, I don't think this is a, for, for us older people like me, I don't think this is a VHS beta discussion. I think this is, um, I think we're going to have VHS and beta, not one or the other, I think. Now, who knows, you know, five years from now, we'll come together and we'll know more. Um, but I personally think this is going to be a combination. I think, I think all of these solutions have to be applied to the challenge. Absolutely. So I, I don't currently see any questions Oh, okay, I see one. Um, and my household has one BEV and one fuel cell. There are advantages of both, and I think it's wonderful that you're pursuing both. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and, and the, to our audience, please feel free to keep uh, typing your questions into the chat box. Uh, and I'm curious, what was your, so you've been, uh, 
now doing both uh, battery and, and fuel cell. What's the public reaction been to adopting zero emission vehicles? And uh, is that something that the public has been excited about or, or is it more just kind of swapping it out, uh, you know, one bus to another, that folks care more about where they're getting to where they need to go rather than the actual vehicle doing it. Kevin or Felicia, do you want to tackle that one? I'll, I'll start on that one. I know one of the, you know, the early uh, experiences we had with deploying the fast charge buses on line 291 in Pomona and line 291, it's a, it's a, it's a real um, workhorse for us. You know, there's a lot of uh, boardings, lots of ons and offs, uh, high ridership on, on that line. And early on, we discovered that some customers didn't even realize they were riding an electric bus. Um, you know, we, we, we would ask, what, how, do you, how do you like the bus? The, the electric bus is like, oh, I didn't even know it was electric. So we, we kind of recrafted our, our branding on the outside to, to, to bring that more, more to light for customers just so they would, they would know it. But, uh, you know, the other side of that was, that was to a certain extent, a good thing. You know, they, they just wanted to get on the bus and get to where they were going and that was happening. And so, you know, so there were some pluses there, but we did want to kind of target that, uh, that messaging. So maybe Felicia, if you want to add on anything there. Yeah, I do actually. There was a story that I'll tell you. Um, we had started when we opened up the, the North South route the, from Azusa, we, that Azusa Intermodal Transit Center is actually also the, uh, start and end point for line 187, which goes into downtown Pasadena. And we had started to build in some electric bus usage on that line into downtown Pasadena. And it was just sort of part of our normal scheduling. We didn't think it was a big deal until the reporter from the Star News saw it in Pasadena and said, it called me up and said, hey, uh, so I just saw this bus in downtown Pasadena and it's all electric and why didn't you tell me? Um, and I felt a little bit sheepish and I apologized. I said, well, I, and this is where collaboration helps. I didn't check <laughs> with my team to see if we were putting in downtown Pasadena. Um, but uh, the, he was very excited by the fact that our electric bus was the first electric bus in the city of, in the use in the city of Pasadena. And it became a big story. And when we then fed that through social media, uh, the customer response was really positive. And people started asking, well, when is my city going to get a chance to get zero emission bus technology? I think people are really excited about the potential of this tech. I think people recognize on a lot of different levels that it is a quality of life improver in communities because it reduces sound pollution and it also reduces local air pollution. So um, there's a couple of different narratives you can hit with that. I think ultimately it does transition. There's excitement at first and then eventually it's no big thing. And as long as it keeps working and getting people to where they need to go safely, um, that's ultimately what people care about. That's a really great point. And I think we heard, I think it was Joe earlier who told us that uh, Duarte was the first city to say, hey, we want these uh, electric lines to come here. Have you, uh, so it sounds like that's kind of becoming more widespread that other cities, uh, in addition to Duarte are asking for these electric lines. Uh, and Joe, I think you also said that we have, uh, you have four lines that are wholly electrified right now. Uh, is there a plan to electrify other lines or are you going through a strategy of um, mixing them in into other lines? What's, what's uh, your approach there? Actually, um, kind of like what Felicia was saying, we've um, interlined um, some of the vehicle blocks on line 280 or some of the vehicle schedules. So we actually do have a smattering of the electric buses on other lines. They may not, these um, other lines may not be fully electric, but, but they do have them. So we have um, line 187, which as Felicia mentioned, goes from Azusa to, uh, to Pasadena. And it also goes along, um, I believe I, I've seen it on 178, which goes through the city of West Covina. So kind of like what Felicia was saying, it, it's kind of, a, kind of a hit and miss, find the electric bus. But um, this kind of helps us to, to kind of test the buses, you know, really put it through its paces to make sure it can be used fleet wide and just not, or system wide and not just for a specific route. And, and really uh, but, the next step in the journey is to, um, 
uh, to deploy the other zero emission bus, the fuel cell buses, which will be our next group of 20 buses coming into the fleet. Uh, again, much in the same way, we have one particular line that we're planning to concentrate those, those vehicles on, uh, but we're also looking to deploy the fuel cell buses on other routes to see what their performance is. Um, so, you know, right now it's sort of, you know, spot the, um, the, the grid powered zero emission buses in the fleet. There's 30 out of 370. But as the numbers grow, it'll be easier to spot them, whether it's a fuel cell bus, whether it's a grid powered bus, but there'll be more of them in different parts of the community. And that's, that's really cool. Yeah, maybe it'll eventually be flipped. People will be like, oh, whoa, a CNG yeah, bus. Look at that. that old bus. <laughs> How old school. <laughs> exactly. And Michelle, as we make this transition, what do you think, uh, the, uh, how much of importance do you think uh, subsidies and help from state government, and maybe also the federal government will, will play? And, and do you see that something that, that assistance can eventually be phased out in the next couple of years? Or how do you kind of see that, uh, that playing out? Wow. Um, are we almost out of time? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so my dream is that the assistance would increase as we go through the next years. That in fact, the users of transportation will not have to pay more to ride cleaner buses, which uh, benefit the whole region, which benefit the whole state, which benefit the whole area that's deploying them. And, um, so how we will pay for those increased costs is, I don't know, but I, I, one of the things that happens frequently, I've been in government um, just a few years and we get mandates and we in finance call them unfunded mandates. It's like, okay, you will have all electric buses by 2030, really. And where's the revenue gonna come from to pay for those buses? So, I'm hopeful that our, our progressive leadership in both the state and the federal, the feds, go Mayor Pete, will, um, will help us to have the kinds of revenues that we need, the kind of funding programs that we need to um, enable us to move swiftly towards this very important goal. Maybe I should run. <laughs> Well, and uh, one, one little side note on that, Michelle, you're going to have to change your vocabulary because as of today, I believe it's, you should yeah. refer to him as a secretary, Pete. So, yeah, he's uh, not mayor Pete anymore. Okay. That's, right. <laughs> That's a lot of great points, uh, Michelle. And I think as we heard from uh, one of our guest speakers uh, two weeks ago from ARB, Yachun Chow, uh, she mentioned that this is, these are electric vehicles for everybody. So by electrifying these vehicles, you know, you're providing zero emission vehicles uh, you know, to, to anybody who, who wants to use them to, to get around. And then another great point is that, you know, it's probably going to take partnerships with, for example, SoCal Edison and others across the region and the state to actually make these things happen because we can't necessarily go it alone is what I'm hearing. All right. Well, I'm seeing a slowdown on the questions in the sidebar. So, um, oh, right when I spoke, we have another question. So, Keep them coming, we do have some more time uh, today, but one that just popped up are, what are examples of workforce development and training needs related to your adoption of zero emission technology and how have you addressed them? A rolling question for sure. Um, first off, uh, I think um, in terms of training is driver training, uh, driving a zero emissions or battery electric bus is totally different from driving a CNG bus, which is equipped with a internal combustion engine. Uh, drivers uh, need to get familiarized on how they dock at a charging station. That's uh, really important. Um, as Joe mentioned earlier in his presentation, if you missed a charge, now, you, now you're going to add up additional time to charge your buses. So if a, if a driver misses the, the, the uh, charging port and they have to go back around and, and pull up again. But uh, in addition to that, um, mechanics training is really, really important. Um, there's a lot of uh, differences between, although there are si similar mechanical uh, systems on a CNG bus compared to a battery electric bus, but there are huge differences in terms of the propulsion system 
the energy uh, delivery system of a, a, a battery electric bus, as well as learning how to be safe when you're uh, fixing or, or, or repairing a battery electric bus. Obviously, we don't want anybody to get injured. That's the last thing that, that um, we would want to see. There's a lot of software engineering that's required in terms of uh, operating a battery electric bus and maintaining the energy and balancing the, the energies in the battery cells themselves. So um, there's a huge amount of training. Do we need to have engineers working at our facilities in order to understand this technology better? I don't know, um, depends on what the OEMs wanna provide. Um, we do have robust training that's provided by, by Proterra for our mechanics but I think there's additional training that's necessary um, to a point where in, you know, we might need someone who knows, uh, who's familiar with software programming or whatnot. Um, it, it's, it's a very complex uh, technology. Um, it's not so totally different from an internal combustion engine. And um, you need to have specific software uh, requirements in order to diagnose uh, um, a battery electric bus and there's costs associated with that uh, to be able to access uh, the diagnostic system for each bus. And I think as we move forward, as you, there are operational issues in terms of, you know, large scale, unfortunately there hasn't been any large scale deployment of battery electric buses. So what's the impact of a large scale deployment when you have 200 battery electric buses and you have your planners and your dispatchers need to know where the buses are, what state of charge, what's been charged, how do you assign deploying those buses? So there's a lot of understanding and develop, I mean, learning on, on the operation side that we haven't really touched. Everybody's been talking about driver and mechanics, but as we move forward with larger scale, then you know, there's another throng of, of training that's required for your planning uh, staff and your dispatching staff. Really great points, Roland, and, and thank you to our audience for that question. Really important about the folks who are going to be working and operating uh, these vehicles. Uh, Ed Kruger, you have your hand raised. I will unmute you now so you can, uh, or I'll ask to unmute you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And while you un unmute I'm yourself. Unmuted. Oh, I'm Unmuted. I just asked if the webinar would be available, and you answered that on a chat piece with us that we'd be able to pick it up because the information that here is very well presented and interesting to a lot of people. That's yeah, it. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate that. And yes, to answer your question, it will be posted. I uh, provided that link in the chat, and everybody will. Everybody who's registered will receive a link. Um, to the recordings and to the presentations as well. So thank you uh, for, for your comment and, and uh, for your interest in, in learning more. And I think we had one more question. Is your paratransit, paratransit zero mission or planning to go zero mission in the near future? Um, here, here in Los Angeles County, we, um, we have handled the paratransit requirements a little bit differently in that all of the fixed route operators in Los Angeles County have pulled together to create a special purpose organization, Access Services. It's a public organization that provides paratransit on behalf of all of the operators. So from a foothill transit standpoint, we're not directly driving um, the, the paratransit program. I do have the honor of serving on the, para, the uh, Access Services Board, and it is a topic that we're, we're beginning to discuss. But I think in terms of where we are from the access standpoint, uh, we've still got a lot of, a lot of learning to do in terms of moving to zero emission vehicles for paratransit delivery. Much like fixed route bus delivery with paratransit operation, uh, I'm sure many of the folks that are here with us know, those paratransit vehicles are in, they're, they're moving constantly. And so making sure that we can handle the range and making sure that we can handle um, the, the unusual events that happen, um, the traffic congestion, um, issues that might come up that cause delays in, in transporting passengers, We've really got to make sure we've got enough energy to get the job done and take care of that more vulnerable population. So again, I think it's an area that we're going to see continue to evolve and um, uh, advance, but we've got a long way to go.
That's great. I'll put out a final call for for any questions from the audience. We're getting in, into the last 14 minutes or so of the presentation or of our um, time today. But I'll give a quick last call for questions. All right, I have a last question of my own uh, for Doran. So now you've been operating electric buses since 2010. And uh, with that experience with over 10 years under your belt, uh, what are your biggest takeaways that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, we, we've, we've made a lot of progress. We've, we've tried a lot of different things. We've learned a lot. Um, I think in terms of, of, of takeaways, um, this is a space that continues to evolve and we all have to lean in together to work together to figure out how to optimize it. Again, we've learned a lot. Um, we share and collaborate constantly. And um, really it's, it's forums like this that are so important to advancing uh, towards this goal of a zero emission, uh, sustainable, clean future. And, and Joseph, to, to you and all of our friends at, at SCAG, thanks for, for, for putting this series together because it's really, here that we can share the information and learn from each other. Um, there, there's a lot more to be done. And, um, uh, you know, we, we've still got a lot to learn as, uh, as an industry, as providers to, to ultimately optimize the technology and accomplish the goal that we've collectively set out to, towards accomplishing. We're excited about the future. We're committed to making it happen. Um, but the other thing, and, and another, another key takeaway here, we've talked about this at a few points, um, we can be committed, we can be excited, we can be supportive, but we've got to have the resources to make it happen. And that's the other part of it. Um, without the resources, it's just a dream. With careful investment of resources, and that's resources at all level, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, we can get there. Uh, but we've got to be able to pull together, to collaborate, to make those investments to make it all happen. Those are really fantastic takeaways, Doran, and, and I think, uh, I hope our audience has a lot of takeaways of their own from, from this event. Uh, 